I am so excited for this next session. We are going to be talking about TV's inevitable multi-currency future. And I would really, I'm really excited to welcome Jody McAfee, Senior Vice President of Agency Partnerships at iSpot TV. Hey, Jody, thanks for being here. The coveted post Andy Cohen <laughs> slot. Hey, it's still a pretty full house. I mean, I hate to disappoint. Um, the only shagging going on in currency is, me is, is purely metaphorical. Um, so just so we're so we're clear on expectations here. <laughs> we're setting the bar real high. That's right. Um, so you and I were talking backstage. We can honestly talk about currency and measurement for two hours versus 20 minutes, especially coming up on the upfronts. But we have a lot to get into in 20 minutes. Um, but can you start by kind of breaking down iSpot's offerings and its current space or current place in the measurement landscape right now? Well, that's actually probably the easiest part of the conversation. <laughs> Obviously, iSpot has a reputation as a leader in the measurement space and has for the, about the last decade. Um, we do a very good job of basically measuring um, a 360 view of the life cycle of, of content and, and advertising, starting with a, a creative assessment product suite that, um, is, that puts us in a position to evaluate creative both pre, mid, and post campaign. We've got media measurement tools. We've got a unified measurement tool that connects linear to uh, streaming and OTT and CTV. Uh, and then we have post campaign tools and, and a attribution capability that allows us to tie all of that data into business outcomes. Okay. So that is the elevator version of well, we only have 20 minutes, so thank That's you right. for the elevator pitch. Um, but speaking of that landscape, ugh, there's so much I want to ask, though. What's going on? Like, everyone is talking about measurement. <laughs> uh, there's always been, so especially coming up on the upfront, like, we've always had transactions on alternate currencies, but we're seeing that trend accelerate. We saw that last year, and I think we're going to see it even more this year. So how do we get there? How do we adopt alternate currencies on traditional linear as we see all these measurement companies jump into the space? So I think a good starting point your question about what's going on is sort of where we're not going back. And that's really bad grammar. <laughs> um, what is not going to happen is that we're not going back to a single monopolistic currency. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's pretty clear that the market is done with that. Um, I think that over time there will be more than one currency. I think that potentially over time you'll see as many as a dozen currencies. Mm -hmm. I think we're a long way away from that because if you're going to shift what amounts to a 50-year metric and an ecosystem including workflow and pipes and the hold codes and the publishers, all of whom have wrapped themselves around that metric but obviously have a huge appetite for, to evolve and change, that's going to take some time. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier about what that means, and it's kind of like, in some respects, sort of ripping the pipes out of an apartment building and have, having to completely replace them. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, and it's going to be messy. It's not going to be pretty. Um, I think the, another thing, in addition to the fact that we're not going back to a single currency world, I think that there are a couple of almost philosophical bits that we should all remember, one of which is just because there's a new currency that is different mm -hmm. um, and specifically different than Nielsen doesn't mean it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's going to be a lot of education involved in terms of that bridge from the legacy currency to new currencies. And frankly, part of our job and, and my job, particularly given my remit, is to educate and, and help agencies and the hold goes understand, here's why that's different, here's why this is better, this is why you need to go to this place. Yeah, and that's something you and I have talked about a lot is the idea of adapting to new currencies when you're so comfortable with the traditional, with Nielsen, right? So what are the kind of the challenges there? How do you guys, how, how do we make people a little more comfortable with the new innovations? So first off, nobody ever got fired for using Nielsen. So that's <laughs> one funda another fundamental truth. I'm full of those today. <laughs> um, I, so it's... It, there is a certain amount of fear involved, right? Because we're talking about, you know, let's take measurement and kind of set it over here and principles around things like speed um, and, and attributes that I think are perfectly suitable for something like measurement. Mm -hmm. And then let's pivot over to currency. 
and now, now the things that I think are more important in a currency world are things like precision and stability. Mm -hmm. And so I think in measurement, you sort of you look at product evolution and you, and you think to yourself, okay, we made that better, um, and so you should be happy that we made it better. I think with currency, change actually to some people is frightening, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're more concerned about stability. Um, I think the other thing you and I talked about, and, and I've said this before, I sort of refer to currency as religion. Um, it requires a certain amount of faith, and, and to have that faith between a buyer and a seller requires a tremendous amount of trust. And so I, I think that ties back to the stability piece and the fact that you're going to have to build a body of work mm -hmm. that causes people in the marketplace to trust you as a currency. Well, we're in a house of worship here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had this idea that I was going to refer to Nielsen as Scientology, and then I realized oh, no. <laughs> I realized I was going to be insulting Scientologists, and so I decided that was a really bad idea. <laughs> okay, I'm. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. <laughs> I hadn't heard that joke yet. I'm I, I enjoy that. Um, all right, regrouping here. Um, <laughs> So we've, we've talked about trust and we've talked about kind of evolving in that way, but what about partnerships? Like how can iSpot work with other publishers? I know you guys work with NBC Universal to advance where we are. So again, this kind of goes back to the idea that I think the marketplace understands that there are going to be multiple currencies. Mm -hmm. I think our relationship with NBCU has been incredibly strong, incredibly fruitful, and it is kind of common knowledge in the marketplace. We are working with other publishers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're doing some testing with Disney. We've got a very strong partnership with Paramount that will probably lead to some interesting news in the not too distant future. Um, <laughs> and, and so we're working with all the publishers in the space, whether that's in, in a testing phase or whether we're actually transacting with the likes of, of NBCU and probably others mm -hmm. in this upfront. Um, I think the thing to remember though is that going back to the fact that this is a challenge and when you take the, the publishers and the holdcos and the, the, the workflow companies. And not, no two companies are on the same sort of evolutionary arc in terms of their current new currency progress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yesterday's Warner Brothers Discovery announcement, which we think was great, because, but it was primarily focused on advanced audiences. Mm -hmm. We actually made a conscious decision to focus primarily on broad demos in our initial work like I said, we're working with Warner Brothers Discovery. At some point, they will be using us for advanced audiences. But given our current focus on broad demos, that integration work is a little bit behind other work that we had prioritized. Our opinion is that while advanced audiences are important, that's where, what, 5% of the market is right now, and where the real money is is in broad demos, and so that's where we chose to focus. That's interesting because I was going to ask how, because there's so many companies in the measurement space right now. Like you, you mentioned the Warner Bros. Discovery News yesterday. That was with VideoAmp and Comscore and other two big players. Um, how is iSpot differentiating itself from all the noise that's happening? And what do you guys kind of offer that other companies can't? So I think our ability to tie linear to CTV and to bring incremental reach and frequency into the marketplace, CTV verification into the marketplace, I mean, honestly, we're only one of two companies that also brings personification and the idea of co-viewing mm -hmm. into our currency suite. The other one is Nielsen. Um, we're very quick to say that there's no such thing as a perfect data set. I think that while there are some fundamental signals that a lot of different companies use, Inscape data set is an example of that, um, we each sort of bring our own secret sauce in, into the space, which, again, ties back to my belief that you're going to have three, four, five different currency providers in the marketplace over time. Okay, and then we've touched on this a little bit, but the upfronts are coming up, which is my busiest time of year, and I'm sure you're very free and not busy at all. Um, but what are kind of iSpot's priorities heading into the upfront, and what kind of overall trends are you seeing in the landscape right now? So I'd say probably our single biggest priority heading into the upfront is, is servicing and supporting the, the NBCU Currency Council. Mm -hmm. So there are currently 14 brands that I'm not going to be able to name off the top of my head. They're big brands, though. They are big brands um, that are part of the Currency Council that will be transacting on iSpot data in this upfront. Um, I think that next in the queue will be the work that we're doing with a particular 
partner that gets announced tomorrow um, that I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> um, Check out nodweek.com tomorrow, guys. And, and then, um, you know, continuing to support the fidelity of the data and educate the marketplace. I mean, specifically in terms of my remit, again, it, it's, I'm very focused on the idea that we manage expectations, that we're very clear with our, with our partners and specifically the hold codes that, you know, there's going to be some turbulence. This is a long game. Let's roll up our sleeves, work together. Let's, let's help make your life as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and try to create that bridge from legacy currency to new currencies. Absolutely, and I think that's something you and I have talked about too, that the idea that we can solve this in a year or two, it's just, it's not feasible. No, it's, it's not feasible. Um, I think it's going to definitely be incremental. Um, I'm probably as, inc I mean, I'm clearly old enough to have been doing this for a long time. Um, I'm about as encouraged as I've ever been about where the market is. In some weird respects, I do think that, um, I don't want to say we got lucky, but the, the pandemic sort of accelerated some change mm -hmm. in many ways. I think it, um, I think it sort of lit a fire under the idea that viewing behavior was starting to migrate more from linear to streaming. Absolutely. I think during the pandemic, and sorry if I'm telling you guys something you already know, um, you know, there was a window of time where there was no production, there was a dearth of fresh content, and people were going down, you know, smart TV rabbit holes to find new content. And so the, the migration of eyeballs to streaming accelerated. I think that definitely got the attention of the publishers, which then caused there to be a more serious focus on the idea of a more holistic cross-platform measurement and currency tool in the marketplace. Absolutely, and I'm glad you brought up streaming because I wanted to ask you specifically about some of the challenges that companies are facing now with the acceleration to streaming. So what particular, what particularly about streaming and connected TV is proving difficult? Um, I, I guess to say it's difficult, so this Maybe also, it's not difficult. Well, I think there are certain aspects of it that are difficult. I think that, you know, we're actually, we've, we've rolled out a product that is called CTV verification that was the result of some work that we did with Group M. Um, for those of you that are not aware of this, uh, the backstory is that a particular Group M executive was binge watching um, Bosch off of an Amazon Fire Stick, turned off his smart TV, turned it back on the next night, eight more episodes of Bosch had cycled through his, his dongle. So because he was at Group M, his first thought was, well, wait a minute. Fair enough, Amazon Prime is a premium service. What if that's also happening on ad-supported services? So reached out to iSpot. We conducted a study with Group M over, I want to say it was an 18-month period of time, and determined that there was a pretty high percentage of ads that were getting served to ancillary devices. So, so that everybody's clear, this is not a smart TV problem in terms of native, native apps that are on a smart TV. This has to do with an ancillary device that is plugged into the smart TV. Um, but in, in, a, in a year's time, as many as 17% of the ads that were served to those ancillary devices were served to TVs that were turned off. It's about a billion dollars in ghost impressions in a given year. And so because we are utilizing um, ACR data off of smart TVs, we can actually detect what's happening at the glass and we know if the TV is on or off. So we have a product that is that it basically is used for CTV verification that an agency can use for the purposes of knowing this percentage of, of ads that, you, that we bought from you were served to TVs that were off. Now, we're in the middle of the development of some additional verification tools that include co-viewing, mm -hmm. because we think that co-viewing in, in the CTV environment significantly undercounts impressions and inventory. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we have a pending solution for that. And then we also have a, a streaming currency capability that we'll be rolling out around deduplication and the ability to dedupe against, uh, de reach, and against reach and frequency mm -hmm. on linear. Absolutely, that's really interesting. And I, I remember when the study came out, I think we covered it, but a billion dollars just from TVs that are turned off. Um, it's, it's a lot of money. Yeah. It's not house money, that's for sure. No, it is not. <laughs>
Um, so t we've talked a little bit about the challenges with streaming, but are there any other areas in the overall measurement landscape that are proving challenging, per se? Um, any other areas in measurement that are proving challenging? I mean, I think right now, at least from our perspective, the bigger challenges are around currency, which obviously is, is tied to measurement. Um, but again, it's what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. It's just turning a giant ship. Um, I, we're, I think we're encouraged by the appetite for new currencies. I think that adoption is is slower than the entire market would like, mm -hmm. um, but that adoption is coming. Um, but no, I mean, it's just, it's just slow moving, I think is the biggest challenge. Well, that leads me perfectly into, we have the technology, but how do we get there? So how do we go about adopting these currencies? Um, and I know there's groups working on it, like the JIC and all Look, I, I actually, so it's interesting. I generally and usually have a fairly dim opinion of things like JICs. Um, I think in this instance, it's going to be a huge benefit to the industry. I think that this kind of goes back to what I was saying about not everybody being on, on the same place on the evolutionary curve. I think you also have a lot of nuances around solutions across companies. Mm -hmm. And so I think any time that you can get the industry writ large to agree to at least something foundational from a standards perspective. I mean, to me, standards have always been this funny thing around, but we need a standard, we need a standard, we need a standard, but oh, by the way, I still need my little bit of this to be different because I need to be able to differentiate my capabilities from my competitors' capabilities. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a rock and a hard place problem from a standards perspective. So I think where the JIC is gonna be incredibly beneficial is this idea that it's, it's at least creating something of a level playing field from a standards perspective to which those of us who are going to um, be in the currency marketplace are at least working from that same set and then in a position to build on top of it. And so I think that collective is going to be super beneficial to the industry as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that don't know, the JIC is a consortium of publishers and measurement companies. It was announced only a week or two ago that are working to try and solve a lot of what we talked about here. Um, how's it been going so far? Um, I mean, for us, I think it's been going really well. We, it's, there has been an initial round um, of information that has been distributed. I think we feel really strongly about our place in terms of the work that we had already done towards currency, I think fits in very nicely where we think the JIC is headed. Mm -hmm. I think obviously the work that we'd, we've already been doing with the likes of, of NBCU and Paramount helps us in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so far so good as far as we're concerned. Great, and that's kind of what I've been hearing from other people too, everyone seems, and like you said, a lot of people are kind of iffy about things like the JIC, but everyone I've talked to has been really enthusiastic about it. Well, and I, there's, a, there's a bit of a nuanced difference. Um, somebody may know more about this than I do. My understanding is that a JIC is really sort of a European construct, and this isn't actually a JIC in the traditional sense of the term, because more often than not, what happens with a JIC in, in countries in Europe is that a a group in a particular industry comes together and they actually select a single vendor. So that's the point of a JIC in Europe. That's not what is happening here. There's going to be a group that basically creates a particular standard to which multiple vendors should be building their products and services for the greater good of the industry. So it's, there's a little bit of a nuanced difference there with the JIC. And we've got time for one more question before we go into audience Q&A and it's really, really easy. So. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about where we are. Where are we going? What do you see the rest of 23 looking like? What do you see 24 looking like? What do you see the next five years looking like? Five years. So for the rest of this year, and this is what we're consistently hearing from at least all of our clients, which is there's definitely an appetite, but it's going to be an incremental appetite in terms of you're going to see transactions happening on alternative currencies. Some of those transactions are going to happen on broad demos, largely as part of the Currency Council. Many of those transactions are going to happen on advanced audiences, but you are going to see transactions happening this year on alternative currencies. 
I think that the balance between legacy and new is going to shift significantly, significantly going into 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And then I think beyond 24, 25 into, you know, 2030, you're going to see four, five, six currencies in the marketplace. Now, I also believe that part of what is going to be necessary to make that happen is that the, the, the pipes and the workflow is going to have to become um, much easier mm -hmm. and, and also in, in many respects standardized because, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's no secret. Um, look, agencies are under-resourced and overworked and we've got to figure out a way to hand you an easy button so that you know, if there are four, five, six currencies in the marketplace that you're in a position to basically look at a single dashboard and say, I need a pharma currency today, boom. Um, that's a ways away. All right, well, thank you. Do we have any questions for Jody in the audience? Come on. I insulted the Scientologist. <laughs> you insulted the Scientologist. <laughs> Um, okay, well then I have another. What would you say the biggest weaknesses are right now? Like where can you guys mostly work to improve? iSpot or the industry? Let's do the industry, I'll protect iSpot. Thank you. Um, you know, this kind of gets back to my comment about just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong. And this goes back to my days at Inscape because there was always this funny thing that happened, particularly in my early days of Inkscape, which was, hey, we know, we know that the legacy currency is, is flawed. We're looking for different data sets for the purposes of measurement. Can we take a look at your data? Of course. Here's a month of, here's a month of Inkscape data. Here's a month of smart TV data off of, you know, back then, 10 million TVs. Take a look at it. 30 days go by, they come back. This is fantastic. I need you to make this look more like Nielsen. The Scientologist. You just told me that what you were looking for was something that was better than that, and now you want me to make it look like that. I think you're seeing some of that now in terms of, I'm super encouraged by the fact that um, there, there's definitely an appetite for change. There's definitely an appetite for evolution. But part of that appetite has now become, hey, yeah, now we know this is flawed, but whatever you bring us needs to be perfect. It's going to take all of us time to get to perfect. Mm -hmm. And we're sort of in a little bit of a window of perfect can be the enemy of incrementally much better mm -hmm. than what we had. Let's remember that as we continue to make strides towards perfect. Sorry, I was thinking that's a really good. Do you think, has that been shifting recently? Like the idea of trying to get data, like of companies coming back to you saying, make it more like Nielsen. Has that changed? That's shifted, yeah, entirely. Okay. I think that... Um, I mean, look, five years ago, we were still explaining to people what ACR meant. And so the, the rapidity of education and adoption just in five years to me has been pretty staggering in terms of people's willingness. I mean, when I first started at, at Inkscape, I don't think it was, it shouldn't be surprising that our earliest adopters were primarily ad tech companies mm -hmm. because a lot of those users sort of came into the conversation with, with digital proclivities. Mm -hmm. So they looked at it and went, this is great, this is like digital. The more difficult conversations were with publishers and agencies in trying to help them with that bridge from legacy currency to more digital-like metrics and currency. Gotcha, and I think we do have an audience question. Hi, uh, great panel. Uh, but my question is, uh, you, you talked a little bit about the uh, uh, iSpot study and a billion dollars in ads being played on, you know, TVs that are off. Has there been any uh, updates since then? Is the industry doing anything to correct that? Or is it more of a, you know, now we need to look at a measurement uh, to know how many ads are being played on a blank TV and then, uh, you know, go back to... Uh, who the transactions are with and yeah. say, I, this is them. So I think there is recognition across the industry that it is an industry problem. I would still, to just, you know, before I was at iSpot, I was at Vizio. Before I was at Vizio, I was at Samsung. And so it, it's, the problem itself is a little bit of a hot mess. 
but I say that knowing that the OEMs and the publishers are incentivized to try to figure out a way to fix it. Fixing it is not going to be easy. And a lot of that simply has to do with the fact that it's a bit of a mixed bag. And what I mean by that is when, when a, a dongle or an ancillary device gets plugged into a smart TV, there's a handshake that happens. That handshake is not the same from dongle to smart TV across all the OEMs, all the, all the ancillary device manufacturers. There's, there's layer one of the problem. Then all of the publishers are developing apps, none of which are using the same API for app development across that footprint of devices, whether it's OEMs or dongles. That's hot mess number two. So fixing that is a pretty big lift that's going to take some time. Now, in the meantime, I think for us, we see, we see opportunity on both sides of the equation, and that's, where I was, that's why I was referencing our co-viewing capability because we actually do think there's a tremendous amount of undercounting that's happening in CTV. And so if there's an ability to put the agencies in a position to understand which, what TVs are off, but an ability to give the publishers an opportunity to understand that there actually are a lot more impressions for them to sell, there's a little bit of a balance in all of that that we think is a win for everybody while the industry writ large is sort of fixing the bigger problem. All right, I think that is a great way to end it on. Thank you guys. Thank you. And thank you, Jody. Thanks.